what I find so striking about the memorial is that it's about people, it's about names, and it brings home the scale of the loss that the Vietnam War meant for Americans. And it personalizes it so you can imagine the individuals connected to each name that is on the memorial and the way the loss spread out across a community of people that for me were my classmates, my cohort, my colleagues. I'm of an age where, and I often think about this, had I been a man, I would have had to decide, would I have gone into the military? Would I have risked being one of the names on that memorial? Hi, Drew. It's such a pleasure to be here with you on Counter Memories. Um, for the, for our audience who doesn't know who Drew Faust is, I don't know why you would not know who Drew Faust is, but you know she is the she she is the former president of Harvard University, and I had the pleasure of meeting Drew when I spent a year at Harvard at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, uh, of which. Drew was also the the dean. I think you were the actual dean at the time when when I was there. And I had just read at that point, uh, This Republic of Suffering, your magisterial book about the Civil War and its aftermath in terms of just the enormous toll that the, the suffering and the death of that war took on the American people and how it really changed American ways of, of thinking about death and about mourning ways that I think are still uh, with us today. Um, and of course, you, you as a historian of that, of that time period are, are an expert on so many of the issues that are still with us. You know, and we'll talk a lot about that, I think, in terms of the legacy of the Confederacy and its monuments and, and what that just means for this country as a whole. Um, and uh, you know, it's such an honor to be here with you with someone who's, uh, who's left such a big impact on the, uh, both on Harvard, but on the American educational landscape. And, on, and of course, on, on the historical and scholarly work of, of the United States as well. So hello, and I'm really looking forward to this. Well, yeah, it's a real honor for me to be here with you. I'm such an admirer of your work. And I think everyone knows who you are, but just in case, Viet Thanh Nguyen, who has a best-selling book just out. It's already a bestseller. You can see it right behind you, The Committed. It's a second novel um, following on uh, The Sympathizer, which won the Pulitzer Prize when it came out a couple of years ago. And Viet has also done a collection of short stories called The Refugees and a collection of writings by others that he's edited on refugees. His work is so embedded in questions that matter a lot to me about memory and about war and about the ethics and responsibility of communities in face of the kind of losses that war brings. And so I'm very excited to talk to him about it today and especially to talk to him about it today because this is the kind of launching moment for the committed. It really just came out and it's getting fabulous reviews and we're very lucky to have yet here because everybody in the world is wanting to interview him right now. So as we think about this notion of counter memories and memorialization, I think back to an earlier book of his called Nothing Ever Dies, which is a nonfiction book about memory and um, the aftermath of war in which he writes about how there are many kinds of monuments and they're the kind of monuments that we think of as monuments. And we'll be talking about some of those in a moment, like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in, in Washington, DC. But Viet also writes that monuments can be um, music or painting or a variety of other forms, including writing. And so I wondered if, Viet, if you tell us a little bit about whether you think of the sympathizer and the committed as in some ways embodiments or vehicles of memory and memorialization? Are they vessels that do part of that work? You know, I, I, I think of them as counter memories. I mean, it's speaking about the, the topic of this uh, show that we're, we're on, you know, I, I grew up in the United States. Um, my parents were born during the era of French colonization. My father is 86 years old now and he can still remember the French songs of his youth. And <laughs> sometimes he'll still sing them to me very nostalgically. So the, the memories of this era of French colonization and then the United States and Vietnam have, have always been with me. And not just personal memories as in my family, but national memories that I've encountered as just growing up as an American citizen uh, in the United States. 
and being saturated with memories of of war. And I think that's true for probably, you know, all national cultures. We we grow up and we absorb whatever the nation thinks is important about its wars. And for the context of the Vietnam War, of course, there was tons of American movies about the, the Vietnam War. And there was, of course, all these American books and journalistic accounts and photographs and presidential speeches. So I think it was basically impossible to escape, you know, the what James Young calls the texture of memory when it comes to this particular war. And, you know, my place in that texture of memory was as the outsider to American memory. Uh, and the term that I used to talk about the place of the Vietnamese in American memory was that we were disremembered, which means that we were not forgotten. You know, if you watch these American war movies, for example, the Vietnamese are always there. So we're remembered, but we're also forgotten simultaneously because we're not there for our humanity or for our stories. We're there as the backdrop for American experiences, which is, you know, I think not unique to the United States. Everybody's ethnocentric. Uh, but when you, as a Vietnamese person, or when I, as a Vietnamese person, see myself in that way, I feel disremembered, remembered and dismembered at the same time. And I think that my experience in France has likewise been been similar. That, of course, I think what the French did in Vietnam and the rest of you know Cambodia and Laos is very important. But I think a lot of the French have totally forgotten that. Or when they do remember it, they remember it through this gauze of romanticism. And so writing these two novels was an act of counter memory, trying to work against what I thought to be the dominant memories of both France and the United States. And uh, you know, my perspective on this is that as a novelist, my novels are very important to me, fiction is very important to me, but I'm humbled by the fact that even bad movies get millions of viewers and a good novel would be lucky to get tens of thousands of readers. And I wonder if you think about that, that dimension of sort of the inequalities of memory, you know, like the, the scale of national memories, the scale of corporate memories, what the nation decides to get behind, and then the vast range of everything else, individual memories, and you as an historian, as an archivist dwell in documents that most of us have never seen, have, have, can't even say we've forgotten because we never encountered them. So there must be great, I don't know, poignancy or to, to seeing that, that difference between what a collective memory is that everyone knows about and the, collect, the memories of smaller groups and of individuals. Well, you raise such an interesting question in relationship to the kinds of memories that my professional work has been about. And those have been, what are our memories of the American South, slavery, and the Civil War? And in the decades in which I've been involved in the profession of being a historian, we have been working hard to change stereotypes and memories that um, made the institution of slavery seem mild and, and benevolent, and that made the Civil War seem like a um, band of brothers who somehow united together at the end, and instead to show what the horrors of slavery really were to show what the real experience of war was like. I mean, my writing that book about death was stunning to lots of people who just never thought about how many people had to die in order for this war to take place because every emphasis had been on glory and, and winning battles and heroism and courage. So to tell the real story and overturn a long tradition of accepted memory, I think is a, is a real challenge for a nation or a um, a group of people. And we see that happening now with monuments and the effort to remove monuments that represent a distortion of our past. We've seen uh, in New Orleans, for example, Mitch Landrieu has written a wonderful book about the challenge of removing Robert E. Lee and the other Confederate monuments from a city which has one of the most diverse populations on earth that in which so many black and brown people were really discomfited by the idea of this um, slave owning uh, scion of the Confederacy, of a traitorous undermining of the American nation on behalf of preserving slavery. How, how can a monument represent New Orleans that is extolling that? And so to revisit our memories and revise our memories, I think we're finding ourselves revising what our monuments are as, as at the same time we're doing the work through books and movies and so forth. I was very interested when you said books have so few readers compared to who goes to the movies. 
is the sympathizer going to be a movie? Are we going to are we going to see you translated into film form? Well, I think we've optioned it for television. And the, the thing I want to point out here, though, is that I optioned it to first a Canadian producer, and then the director that we have lined up is not an American. And this was very important to me. I personally think Americans, when we talk about memories uh, of this particular war, have so many hangups. They, they approach the American war in Vietnam through very particular American assumptions and American experiences. Now, and then Hollywood is a big corporate machine. And I think Hollywood has a very hard time dealing with history because it's, it's the most expensive, film is the most expensive of the art forms, at least the, the Hollywood version of it. So if you have a $100 million, $200 million budget film or TV series, it's gonna be hard for the producers, the creative people to take a lot of risks because so much money is at stake. Whereas again, if you're writing a book as an individual scholar or a novelist or, or as a poet, it's your own time, your own life. But who cares about that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's there's greater possibility of doing things that run counter, we're talking about counter memories, run counter to dominant power and dominant assumptions. And so when we talk about war, you know, of course, the most dominant assumption is that wars are about us, our own side, mm -hmm. our own suffering, our own soldiers, our own civilians. And then to think about the other side you know, whether we're talking about the Civil War uh, and that conflict that's still with us, or whether we're talking about here, the American War in Vietnam, thinking about the other side is really difficult. It's difficult for many of us, you know, to do individually, but then collectively as a nation, it's, it's nearly impossible because I've, I've rarely encountered memorials that acknowledge the experiences of the other side. Uh, they're so rare. Um, and, you know, in, in your own work, as you, as you pointed out, the other side happened to be death that it was easier to commemorate the living, uh, the veterans, um, to glorify these heroic figures, either of generals or the common common soldier. And the, 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 the dead constituted a very significant other to mm -hmm. nationalism uh, and to patriotism, because, you know, as you accurately pointed out, we don't want to think about the human costs of war, except in very uh, trite ways. That's one interesting aspect of Maya Lin's uh, wall or her Vietnam Veterans Memorial that ties together our two sets of interests because explicitly it's not about the living, it's about the dead, about the 58,000 58, plus American soldiers who died. So when you visit, you obviously see the names of, uh, of the dead engraved there and you know you've had extensive experience with uh, with monuments and memorials in american history was this was this uh an innovation in terms of what she was doing in the same way that you were talking about your book as being an innovation in the approach to thinking about war as death rather than as victory well people as you know objected very strongly to the simplicity of her approach until they began to engage themselves with it and i can see precursors of this approach in the Civil War era where naming the dead became such an important way of acknowledging their humanity and turning them from a statistic into human lives. When you come to a situation of mass death, there's a, something that is attributed to Stalin, but it said he never said it, but it's still a great comment, which is a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. So when you have a million deaths, just as we're now trying to figure out what does it mean that more than 500,000 people have died in this country in the last year from COVID-19? How do we retain both their humanity and ours in face of something that's unfathomable? And so in the Civil War era, naming the names, trying to identify, locate, rebury the, the Union dead in national cemeteries, try to uh, put names on as many as possible, even though almost half of them remained unknown. It became a gesture of affirmation of the basic um, human aspect, both of the person who died, but also of the person who was trying to sustain the identity of those that had been lost. And so I think Maya Lin, for whatever reason, cued right into that and picked it up and made that the center of a monument that has been described. I was just reading something by a literary critic and, and he was a, a, a air uh, pilot in World War II <clears throat> named Samuel Hines. He was at Princeton for many years, he's written about war. He describes the Maya Lin Memorial as an anti-rhetorical memorial. 
that there was to be no rhetoric. Well, of course there's rhetoric. It's just a different kind, but it's a stripped down rhetoric in which the names and the humans speak rather than an imposed interpretation by someone creating you know, courses and, and flourishes on a monument. So that, that really interests me, that notion of just digging down into the human dimension and in a sense, reclaiming and noticing those individuals one by one. Mm-hmm. There's a scholar whose name, unfortunately I forget right at this moment, but he characterized um, Mylan's memorial as an insurrection of the dead. Mm. Uh, rising, you know, that, that's a, a very powerful image as well, that's you know, uh, of, uh, there's at least one, I can't remember, again, I, uh, I can't remember the movie, but one of the, the, the World War I movies depicted the ghosts of the dead rising out of the ground. Um, yes. And this, this is what I think uh, is being evoked here in Mylan's memorial as well. But it's obviously very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Now, now the power of Mylan's memorial has been that a lot of people have responded to this idea that when, when you go to the memorial, you see yourself reflected in the black granite among these names. And so you're interpolated, you're called in uh, to this experience. And you think about both who, the, who these people are uh, with their names, but you also your own place relative to them. But it's also uncomfortable for a lot of people as well. And so when you visit the Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial site now, of course, it's not just Myelin's wall, but now you also have Frederick Hart's uh, sculpture of the three soldiers, which depict um, a black soldier, a Latino soldier, and a white soldier uh, standing in a brotherhood uh, shoulder to shoulder. And then you also see Glenna Goodacre's Vietnam Women's Memorial with, uh, I think it's three or four American nurses tending to a wounded American soldier waiting for evacuation. Um, and to me, it, see, it felt like these uh, additional sculptures, these statues were the complete opposite of what Mylin was trying to achieve. They, here they're focused on, these statues are focused on the living mm-hmm. and they're focused on bodies. And that to me seems like the more traditional version of the war mm-hmm. monument that, you know, you see the memorialization of generals or maybe less so common soldiers. And because they're still alive, it's easier to identify with them. And it also gives us the possibility of hope. Like, you know, we we focus on the, the ones who lived and, and Maya Lin is insisting that we look at the ones who did not live. And that's difficult for so many people because you know it's hard to identify with the dead and that's exactly what she seems to be uh doing um and is that a, is that an accurate characterization that, that most of most monuments and memorials at least in the united states are focused on the living or on a representation of what people look like when they were living and something they did that seems to matter i mean the the maya lynn part of the memorial doesn't say they didn't die in vain it doesn't say they died for noble cause it doesn't say they died with courage it just says they're dead. Uh, and that is startling because it, there's no interpretation of the purpose of the sacrifice. And I think lots of people in mourning are looking for they shall not have died in vain kind of reassurance. And that doesn't happen mm-hmm. in, in the, the naming of the names. Mm-hmm. But one other aspect of this, and you, you've been referring um, as is completely appropriate, and we should all be reminded to do so to, to this war as the American war. Um, which it was for everybody uh, who was Vietnamese. And this is a monument for American dead, to American dead. And there's some 58,000, I think, names on the monument. And 3 million Vietnamese died in this war. So that if the monument included all of those individuals, it would be nine miles long or something like that. It just, the scale is so striking. And I mean, what is it like for someone who is Vietnamese to come and see that and to see who is, who is acknowledged and noticed and who isn't? And is that an appropriate memorial? Do we need to somehow have yet another addition, like the the two additional statues to those who lost their lives uh, in in Vietnam. Yeah. Well, m- memorials and monuments are, as you said, a, a form of recognition. And I think the reason why we have the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is because the American veterans after uh, the end of the war felt that they were not being recognized properly by the mm-hmm. by their fellow Americans. 
And I think there's an interesting connection here uh, th that I've seen that I think Jan Scruggs, the chief activist veteran behind getting the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, done, was deliberately invoking the civil rights movement that, you know, the civil rights movement is, has demanded recognition for marginalized, uh, dominated peoples here in the United States and why not American veterans? Mm -hmm. Uh, ironically, I think I think we the, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial though was established well before any civil rights memorials on the National Mall. But that that idea exists, you know, that that we need memorials and monuments to recognize sacrifice and populations. And if 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 one population is recognized, then other people who have been involved say, "What about us?" And so that's why we have the Vietnam Women's Memorial on that site because as very as 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 American veterans who are women very properly said where 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 we acknowledged here and then of course you open up an and potentially I don't know if it's a potentially endless chain but a chain of demands for recognition and this is part of the politics of recognition that we that I think you know is a part of a democracy that we're all familiar with and so yes if you're a Vietnamese or other Southeast Asian Cambodian or Laotian who goes to visit the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and you're cognizant of the fact that in general, Americans are utterly focused on the American experience and have no awareness of what happened to Southeast Asians, then I think you would see, you would intuitively have the sense that once again, you are excluded from this. Now, mm -hmm. you could argue, one could argue that this is a, a memorial to soldiers, to veterans. So therefore, we don't need to acknowledge the, the many hundreds of thousands of Southeast Asian people who died during this war because they were civilians. But now that's a separate issue that I think would be really civilians. important. Yeah. Yeah, civilians, why are civilians not a part of memorials and monuments to war? That's another issue. But we have to remember that if we're talking about Vietnam veterans, you know, South Vietnamese soldiers were there yes. fighting. Fighting for the Americans, right? In for their own the country. And the, the death toll for South Vietnamese soldiers was around 225,000 dead. Uh, why are they not counted? as Vietnam veterans. And in fact, some of, uh, a lot of them did make it to the United States survivors. And some of them have asked to be included in American memorials to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. I can remember at least one incident in Kansas City and they were turned down. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why, well, I know why. I know why they were turned down, but that opens up the, the question of why even in a memorial devoted to war and soldiers can the Vietnamese not be included. Uh, so the, the politics of memorialization are so wrapped up with other issues in every country around inequalities and who counts and who should be remembered. And so again, these war memorials are indexes to so many other issues that take place. Now, yeah, so Viet, I don't know if you um, came to be familiar with this in your year at Harvard, but Harvard has a war memorial that was built by a number of alums at the end of the Civil War to honor the Union dead. And it's a gigantic building called Memorial Hall in which freshmen eat and there's a, a theater there, Sanders Theater, where all kinds of performances take place. But there's a kind of apse, with, like a church with the names of all the Union dead on, on the, the walls. And it's, it's a very beautiful and moving building. And over the years since it was completed in the 1870s, there've been various efforts to include the Confederate dead, the Harvard alums who were Confederate dead. And that has been resisted in, in various forms over the years. At first, the Union um, veterans who endowed the building and gave it to Harvard proclaimed that it should be only for Union dead. And then in the 90s, 1990s, there was an effort to restore and bring the Confederate dead into the, um, restore the names of Confederate dead by bringing them into the, um, into the, uh, same area as the Union dead had been. And that was caused an uproar um, from African-American law students in particular, then, then joined by many others to say, we should not be honoring the Confederate dead. And I think right now, given that Confederate monuments are being taken down, not put up, this is not about to emerge again. But the question of Harvard students who died in the Civil War, one group of them is is named in that space and the Confederates are not. So yeah. I think the politics of that have extended over centuries, more than a century, yeah. as, as who do we honor and who do we not honor has been disputed, even within the confines of American, American landscapes. The closest I can think of that to that 
in terms of what I've what I've seen is the Okinawa Peace Museum, which commemorates the um, horrible battle that was fought in Okinawa uh, in World War II. Around 200,000 people died during this one battle, and the memorial commemorates all sides. So there's there there all the names of the American dead are there, and all the names of the Japanese soldiers are there who died, and then all the all the names of the civilians, Okinawan civilians who were caught up in this conflict are there, as well. So it's a very deliberate statement, obviously, that in a battle or in a war, uh, everyone's equal when they're dead. And uh, to commemorate only one side, oftentimes, you know, deliberately or inadvertently reinforces narratives of nationalism, which will lead us to further conflicts and further wars. Uh, so how do we stop that? How do we, how do we address that in terms of a memorialization? And perhaps in Japan, you know, having been subjected to, you know, mass bombings and, and um, atomic bombs and so on. And the Okinawans obviously feeling that they've been colonized by the Japanese. There's, there's quite a lot of awareness of the sense of, of needing to address civilian death um, and, you know, being defeated to also acknowledge the, the victors. So in, in, the, in the Harvard context and in this context of should, who, who should we remember and all that, uh, I'm sort of agnostic on this question of whether the Confederate dead should be included with the Union dead. But I think if you do that, then then you also have to say, well, what about what about what about the enslaved? What about all the all the victims of the black victims of of, of slavery and so on? And, and so if the advocates of the Confederacy are saying, hey, you know, we should all be remembered. Are they willing to remember what they did to <laughs> black yeah. people and the Holocaust of black people that's been here since the beginning of, of the American country, uh, uh, the founding of this country? And I think a lot of people would be very resistant to that. Right. Yes. There's um, a lot of remembering that needs to be done here. <laughs> Frederick Douglass was very eloquent on this. He, he just said, it matters what you died for. It does. You, know, you it cannot does. separate. Um, but if you want to talk about reconciliation, which I guess is what's the, the, what these advocates are saying for the Confederate dead, mm -hmm. then you have to actually get into what reconciliation really means. Truth and reconciliation and reparations. I mean, it gets very, very yeah. complicated. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are only willing to go when halfway. They just want to say, remember us. That's what they mean by mm -hmm. reconciliation. Mm -hmm when mm -hmm. really we should be remembering the causes and everyone else and not just what happened to us, but what we've done to other people. That's, mm -hmm. I think, the hardest thing for nations and for peoples to do. It's easy to call ourselves victims. We look at the 9-11 memorial, for example, but it's really hard to think of ourselves as somehow playing a role as victimizers. Uh, and and that's true across nations. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I so appreciate your writing on this subject and how you talk about our need to understand our inhumanity as we embrace our humanity and that others have humanity and we have inhumanity and that until we see that whole, we are not going to be able to really be together in a positive way in the world. I, I just think you're, I quote it all the time. Ben. Right. Now, I know that, you know, we've been talking about the, the war in Vietnam and the American war and all that. And I know you've, you actually visited Vietnam as a scholar, um, uh, uh, which I haven't been able to do. Like, I visited Vietnam unofficially as a scholar. Like, I go as a tourist, I have a tourist visa, but I don't dare go under a research visa because then I would be sort of subject to surveillance by, um, mm. by the Vietnamese government. And, you know, my novels are not uh, trans not published in, in Vietnamese in Vietnam because... Really? You know, oh, wow. So I envy, you know. Well, <laughs> I, I actually, I went as Harvard president. Yeah, so there you um, go. So I wasn't, I wasn't doing research, but I had an extraordinary experience and was taken to a lot of sites that were of interest to me as a historian and a American who grew up during the 1950s and 60s and for whom the American-Vietnamese War was a, a rite of passage and a determining factor in my adult consciousness. So to go to some of those places was so very meaningful. The word, the names, you know, you just heard them on the news every night in the 1960s. And then to go and see those, those names as, as real places was, was I've been to, unforgettable. Uh, yeah. As a scholar, unofficial scholar, I've been to some of those places too. And uh, to museums and memorials and cemeteries. And I know you've been to some of these things um, in Vietnamese uh, history museums and war museums, a common feature is a guest book that people can sign. 
And I've read some of them. And what's striking to me is that, you know, there's a whole panoply of international visitors and everybody besides Americans will, you know, will write down when they see, you know, the, 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 the Vietnamese, the victorious Vietnamese recounting of the history of the American war, everybody else will write down, Americans did terrible things in this country. <laughs> now the Americans are split down the middle, typically. You know, half of Americans will say, oh my God, we did terrible things, we're so guilty, we, we're sorry to the Vietnamese people. The other half will say, this is all propaganda. Huh. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, when you were visiting, what was your reaction as, as, a, you know, as an American, like as you said, who lived through this time period, who has memories of this? How was your experience encountering a different version of history than what was being what was and what is being presented to Americans about this war? Well, one of the most unforgettable moments in the, in the trip was a visit to a battlefield called Apbach, where a battle was fought early in 1963, in which the Americans thought they would just polish off a group of Viet Cong, and they flew in helicopters and all the might of, of the American military force. Only the Viet Cong had intelligence, anticipated them, shot down the helicopters. They were outnumbered something like five to one, and they routed the um, American troops. And the Americans were just completely back on their heels. And in a way, it was prophetic of what was to come, that all of this firepower was not going to be the key to victory. Instead, it would be other kinds of, of factors. And so this battlefield is still, it's a monument now in the sense of there's a museum there. There are cutouts of American helicopters showing where they crashed, where the um, Viet Cong were so proud to have brought down these um, mighty machines. And we met with two veterans of the battle, two North Vietnamese, or Viet Cong, sorry, they weren't North Vietnamese, this was a Viet Cong unit, um, who were in their 80s and one was almost 90 and talked about what the war had meant to them and what this battle had meant to them. And, and the battle had meant we can continue to defend our country as we have from the French, from the Chinese, from all the different invading forces over the many decades and even centuries that had preceded the American war. But they were also very warm and one of the people accompanying me from Harvard was a U.S. Army veteran. He wasn't old enough to have been in Vietnam, but he was a, very much a military person. And to see him with these Viet Cong vets was, it was just so meaningful because there was a sense of reconciliation and of the truth that that battle had represented and meant and why remembering that battle and the humility that came from the sense of American loss and the, the grievance that we all felt that we had that many years ago been fighting each other when here we are now, why did we have to do that for such a long time? So it was, it was pretty unforgettable. And I think it was, going back to what you said earlier, it was the truth about the battle and the acknowledgement that the Americans had, had made mistakes, been routed and shown themselves to be on a path of kind of too much pride and too little understanding of the realities on the ground that that would prove disastrous over the coming decade plus. So uh, it was it was quite something. And and I think of the museum showing proudly the source of vic sources of victory, and the the kind of almost Jerry built cutout of the of the helicopter just fixed in my mind as mm -hmm. as um, visual memories of of something much much bigger. Just a little footnote to that. Uh, my novel, The Sympathizer, is based partly inspired by real life spy Fam Swanan, and I believe he was the spy that passed the information on to <laughs> the other. Uh, oh, to really? The, to the, the communist side that led them to be able to ambush the American assault at Up Back. Um, so anyway, that's a little historical footnote. But uh, I think your experience is really interesting because um, you know many Americans have have commented on that 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 the surprising possibility of reconciliation in Vietnam for Americans. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember very vividly doing my informal research. Um, one part of it was I went with a, um, a an American photographer who's a you know, white haired gentleman about of the Vietnam War generation. And we visit, we visited a what, what the Vietnamese call a martyr's cemetery right on the outside uh, for Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon. 
And, um, you know, we encountered a, a family, a large group of people doing a, um, a, um, a death celebration, a death anniversary for one of the dead soldiers there. And they were having a feast, as you do. And when they saw my friend, the photographer, they, they called him over and they offered him a drink and they insisted on having a toast with him because they thought he was a veteran returning and they wanted to, to demonstrate this, this, this peaceful gesture of reconciliation. They thought I was the translator, <laughs> so I didn't get a drink. <laughs> but uh, you know, for 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 me as a Vietnamese uh, American uh, from South Vietnam, going returning to to uh, to Vietnam, what what strikes me is that reconciliation is a lot more difficult in that sense. Like the reconciliation that's taken place in the years after the war between the Vietnamese of different sides has been economic reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So everybody, you know, is invested in either rebuilding Vietnam, uh, turning it into a capitalist country. And if you're a returning Vietnamese person, either to give money to your relatives or to become an entrepreneur in some way, uh, or to participate in the pleasures of capitalism in Vietnam. But what's not allowed in terms of reconciliation is political reconciliation. Like you cannot talk about um, the, the South Vietnamese government or history or stuff mm -hmm. like that in Vietnam. And this is one of the reasons why the sympathizer is not allowed to be uh, published in Vietnam. So what that brings home to me is number one on this topic of counter memories that we, uh, the losers, the lo we from the losing side, and I'm not, I'm not invested in the conflict in that way, but I'm just, I'm a part of the losing side for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. Our counter, our memories are the counter memories mm -hmm. that are not allowed to exist in the memorial landscape of Vietnam. So I've studied these Vietnamese history museums. They all tell the same narrative about you know the victorious Vietnamese Communist Party uh, defeating the outsiders and unifying the country, which is one version of history. But what's not allowed are the counter memories of the of the defeated, and that was that was a civil war for the Vietnamese people. And I'm, I'm thinking to the American Civil War. A civil war is bitter. I mean, more bitter possibly than the wars we wage against people outside mm -hmm. of our countries. And so that's why you know reconciliation. Uh, in, in Vietnam between the Vietnamese is still so difficult and it's easier for the Vietnamese to reconcile with Americans. With the Americans. Yeah, wow. and, and I'm wondering if there's an echo of that in your understanding of the Civil War and its aftermath for Americans. Like, oh. like we're, you know, I, I, to my, from my perspective, it seems like we're still fighting over this Civil War and what it means to this country. Well, the the work, really excellent work on memory and the Civil War that's been done over the last couple of decades and a marvelous book by David Blight um, is, is a real leader in, in this. He teaches at Yale, talks about how we did reconcile North and South around the issue of race and that white Southerners and white Northerners decided to come up with this gallant version of what the Civil War had been. Everyone fought hard and everyone was courageous and now we're back together and isn't that wonderful? But the price of that was to abandon the emancipationist legacy of the war and to say, okay, we will reconcile by not pushing you any further on the issue of equal rights for the emancipated and former slaves. So, um, there is less of that standoff, I think, has been less of that standoff between North and South because of the agreement around racial oppression that the maintenance of white supremacy was more important than any other outcome of the war. And it's it's a really tragic story leading to the establishment of Jim Crow and leading also in the 1890s and the disfranchisement movement, um, which is very unnerving at the moment because we see echoes of it coming in our own time. But that's also a time when there are lots and lots of monuments to the Confederacy erected as kind of part of this national reconciliation and agreement about a version of the, the war that um, whites North and South can come together around. So I, I think it's different from, from what you describe. And I was, I was thinking about, a I think, a South Vietnamese cemetery that you talk about in Nothing Ever Dies, which you said is just neglected as part of the I believe it's part of the kind of continuing hostility between North and South Vietnam. And instead in the United States, we have this proliferation of monuments to Robert E. Lee and so forth at the time uh, of this rapprochement around the turn of the century, uh, three plus decades after the end of the Civil War. 
Yeah, I mean, the cemetery I described where, you know, my friend was toasted uh, is the official martyr cemetery. And literally across the highway is the cemetery you talked about, the, the former Arlington Cemetery for the South Vietnamese soldiers. Uh, you know, uh, in the wartime era, you know, there was not a lot of development in this area. area. So you could see across the highway, you could see the whole expanse on both sides. If you visit now, it's totally built over. It's an industrial zone. So the South Vietnamese cemetery is completely obscured. The 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 martyr cemetery for the victorious Vietnamese is is on the edge of the road, so you can see it when you drive by. But to find the South Vietnamese cemetery, you have to go into a, a maze of roads. And I had to ask people, where is it? And it's totally overgrown, and it has guards, and you have to show a passport to get inside. And it's you know most of it's neglected. So even in the, at the level of memorialization, you can totally see the difficulties of, of reconciliation, as you pointed out. And the cemetery for the defeated itself becomes a counter memory. And, and in the American landscape, um, you know, now we're, now we're, now, now we're, we're, we're I, I hope we're at a turning point. But, you know, the counter memories to the Civil War have been the memories of, of African Americans, you know, contesting um, this, mm -hmm. triumphant, this triumphant reunification and this absol absolution of, of, this, of the South, as, as you were describing. And perhaps that's why it's so painful now that we as a country haven't dealt with these counter memories. Mm -hmm. um, and now we are, uh, for the better, I think, being forced to, to confront them, whether some people want to do that or not. I think that's exactly what's going on right now with the challenge to Confederate monuments all over the country. Things that those of us who were not, um, in a position of being oppressed in quite the same way African-Americans where we just didn't pay any attention to them. They were just sitting there. But for someone who had been in, whose ancestor had been enslaved and, and mistreated and uh, abused by such a person, it's a very different, very different experience. And now we're recognizing that in a, a much fuller way and writing a past that erases, everybody's so worried about erasing the past and a group of students who came to see me a few days ago, talked about how this past we're so worried about erasing, it itself erased most of the past, mm -hmm. that those we have chosen to remember from this era leave out um, vast quantities of the population, such as all the African Americans and the others who were uh, the oppressed and the victims uh, in, this, in this time. Yeah. Perhaps this is a good note to end on because uh, this note of the evolution of memory, because when we're talking about memorials and monuments, they, they seem very fixed on the landscape, oh. they're immobile. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking about statues of generals and soldiers, they're, they're fixed moments in, in time, whereas memory evolves. I think about what I see in Southeast Asia over a decade of doing field work and research. I would see museums literally change in that span of 10 years. The exhibits would change. The very the, the 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 infrastructure would change, as the economy and the politics were changing. Mm -hmm. So memory is a very is just as our own personal memory is fluid, collective memory is fluid as well. And it's really interesting to be a witness to those 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 changes actually happening. And of course, as as we've been talking about when we, when it comes to Confederate memorials, and African American counter memories, we're we're watching that exact moment of evolution taking place. And uh, that's, I think, a good thing uh, because memories shouldn't be fixed. And that's perhaps the greatest illusion that memorials and monuments offer is that somehow we've stopped our thinking about the past when that, that actually never, never happens. And I think in what you just said, there's an important element of that evolution, which is people have agency in making that happen. It's not just a biological process that unfolds in some uh, automatic way that books like yours, interventions by historians, reinterpretations, new, new data, new archives, new points of view, all contribute to asking different questions about the past that make us see it in different ways. So memory evolves partly because we challenge memory and that that's, that's important work. It's been such a pleasure. To talk to you, Jane. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks, Viet.